would, go ahead and turn to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. This is our third week in Titus chapter 2. And uh, the last couple weeks, we've looked at verses 1 through 10. And uh, really, those were instructions, if you remember, uh, for sound living. Paul told Titus in chapter 2, verse 1, he said, You teach what accords with sound doctrine. And then he proceeded to do what? He proceeded to tell different groups how to live. Older men, older women, younger men, or I'm sorry, younger women, younger men. And then he even had some words for Titus and the elders that he was going to appoint, as well as Christian slaves. And uh, if there's one thing we should see from this, from verses 1 through 10, is that we should live differently. That if we are Christians and we say we believe the Bible, that we should live according to sound doctrine. That we should live out what we claim that we believe. If we believe the truth of God's word, then Paul says we should live in light of that truth. And as our hearts are made new, then we have a new way of living. As we read in our scripture reading in Galatians 5, right? That we should be led by the Spirit, not led by the flesh. That was, that was the way that we lived before Christ. But once Christ, once we turn to Him in faith and repentance, then we should live lives that are led by the Spirit. And today in our text in verses 11 through 15, we see really the basis for why we should live differently. So Paul, as I said last week or the couple weeks before, that typically in Paul's letters he will give you some doctrine or some truths and then he will turn around and say, now live in light of this. But in this passage he gives you how to live in verses 1 through 10 and then verses 11 through 15 he gives you the basis or why you should live that way. And the basis for why we should live sound lives or godly lives is this. It is the grace of God. The grace of God. Let's read our text together. Chapter, Titus 2 verses 11 through 15. It says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in the present age waiting for our blessed our blessed hope the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works declare these things Exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. So the first thing we see is this word for. And anytime you see that word for, it's going to connect back to the previous text, the previous uh, pericope or paragraph. And so for, so really what, what Titus is, or Paul saying to Titus is, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Then he gives all these ways to live. Uh, in light of this sound doctrine, in light of the truth of God's word. And then he says, for, for the grace of God has appeared. In other words, we live this way, why? Because Jesus has come. Because for the grace of God has appeared. So verses 11 through 14, we see the basis for why we should live this way, in a spiritually sound way. Two things, the reality of God's salvation and the nature of God's salvation. So really, verses 11 through 14, I love this passage. I actually memorized it this week, or I did my best to. But it is a wonderful passage because it is all about salvation and what the truth or what the gospel implications are for our lives. And so the first thing we see is that we should live sound lives because of the reality of God's salvation. The reality of it. And that's what we celebrate during Advent, isn't it? isn't it? The reality that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. What? But look at verse 11. Such a short verse, but a wonderful verse. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. There is a lot packed into that. But the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. 
as I read that this week, I thought, what an amazing statement. That whether you are young, whether you are old, man or woman, slave or free, the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Every other religion is works-based. Every other religion says that you have to do this or don't do this to be made right with God or to achieve true spirituality, whatever that means for a certain religion. But what does Christianity say? The grace of God has appeared bringing salvation for all people. Christianity is not about what we can do for God, but about what God has done for us through His Son, Jesus Christ. On the cross, you remember what Jesus said. What did He say? It is finished. The price has been paid for us to receive eternal life. The grace of God has come, or it's appeared through His Son, through God's Son, Jesus Christ. John 1.14, one of my favorite verses on Jesus' incarnation, says this, The Word, that's Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And that's really, again, what Advent is all about. The incarnation, or Jesus becoming flesh and dwelling among sinful people. Can you imagine being at the right hand of God and coming down and being born as a baby and dwelling among people like you and me. But we have the people that were here, they have seen Jesus in the flesh. The grace of God came through the Son of God. Jesus came to bring salvation. We could not save ourselves. We could not do enough good things. We could not do enough religious works to earn our salvation. But Jesus appeared. That the Son of God, think about this, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born as a baby. He lived a perfect life of obedience to the Father, and in in due time he was crucified for the sins of the world. And Jesus, the righteous Son of God, he died for our sins in our place, and on the cross Jesus took the wrath of God or the punishment of God upon himself and, in, and he offers his righteousness to everyone who will turn from their sins, repent, and trust in his in atoning work. Notice in verse 11 it says that the grace of God is for all people. When you read that maybe you think, well, that's kind of an odd statement. This does not mean that every person will be saved. Instead, or, or the, the belief that every person will be saved is called what? Universalism. Universal, universalism teaches that everybody will be saved. And Paul is not teaching that. Remember, in chapter 1, verse 16, what did he say? He said, there were people that professed to know God, but they deny him by their works. So Paul is clearly not teaching that everyone will be saved. He said there are some people even that will profess to know God, but they deny Him by their works. Instead, what that all people means is that Jesus offers salvation to all those who will cast themselves at His feet and cry out for mercy. Jesus will not turn anyone away that will repent of their sin and follow Him as Lord. Remember this passage, there were... Paul gave instructions to every person, older men, older women, younger men, younger women, the elders, and Christian slaves. And he's saying, all those people can be saved. Every, whether you're man or woman, black or white, slave or free, if you will humble yourself at the feet of Jesus and turn away from your sin and trust in Him, then you can be saved. And so the grace of God brings salvation. But notice in verse 12, it also trains us for holy living. Now, verse 12, now in the ESV, verses 11 through 14 is one long sentence. So it's kind of hard to break it up, but that's the way I'm going to try to do it. Verse 12, just in the middle of the sentence, says this training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. 
So the, the grace of God has brought salvation. It's appeared. It's brought salvation for anyone that would receive it. And then it says it trains us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. But notice, again, that salvation is not earned by something we do, but rather because the grace of God has appeared, it trains us. The grace of God teaches us or trains us how to live. And I just, that's a neat way to think about it, that because the grace of God has come into our lives, that it trains us to live a certain way. I just think that's a neat idea. We do not live a holy life to be saved by God, but we live a holy life because we have been saved by God. 1 John 4.19 says that we love because he first loved us. We love because he first loved us. The text says that the grace of God is, tra is training us. Notice that it's a current thing. It doesn't say it trains us, but it is training us. The grace of God is training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. Notice what the text does not say. The text does not say the grace of God has appeared so you can be saved and keep living however you want. It doesn't say that. It says, because of God's grace, we are to what? Renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. This is what, or what is that? That is repentance. When you renounce ungodliness and you renounce worldly passions, that means you're, you're saying, I'm not, that's not me anymore. I'm turning away from that. I'm renouncing it. That does, that's not who Matt is anymore. I don't live towards uh, an ungodly life. I don't live uh, a world full of worldly passions. I don't live that way anymore. I renounce that. You, can, or you renounce, when you repent of your sins, you renounce your former way of living. You renounce ungodliness. You renounce worldly passions. I think I said it last week or the week before. Paul Washer says it like this. When you become a Christian, you you love the things you once hated, and you hate the things that you once loved. So you renounce those things. You get rid of them. You cannot have it both ways. You either renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, or you renounce Jesus. You cannot serve Jesus and your flesh. If you refuse to renounce your sin and repent of it, then you have not experienced the grace of God. And you are not a child of God. The text clearly says that if God's grace has come into your life, then you will renounce your sin. I think most of us would agree that if a person who was a Muslim had said that they were now a Christian, so somebody that was a Muslim and now they say, I'm a professing Christian. If that person refused to uh, renounce their devotion to Allah, if they refuse to quit praying five times a day towards Mecca, if they refuse to put away all these things that are part of the religion of Islam, we would probably doubt that that person had really become a Christian, wouldn't we? And yet, how many people in our church think that you can come to Jesus but not renounce your sin? So if someone that had, was a Muslim and they said they became a Christian but they never quit doing the things that made them a Muslim isn't a Christian, then why would the people that say they become a Christian but they never quit doing all the things that are anti-gospel and anti-God, why would we think that they are a Christian? The Bible says they're not. So first, the grace of God trains us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. And second, the grace of God, notice the second phrase, says it is training us to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. So there's a negative aspect where we renounce certain things. We get rid of worldly passions. We get rid of um, ungodliness. And then there's the positive, that grace, the grace of God, trains us to, to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. In verse one, in chapter 1, verse 12, what did Paul, he cited the Cretan prophet, and, and what did that prophet say? Look at verse 12 of chapter 1. A prophet of their own said that Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. And that's how the people that were on this island of Crete, that's the way they lived. 
And that's how the false teachers in chapter 1 lived. The Cretan people lived according to the flesh. They were driven by their fleshly and physical desires. And our culture in America, to me, sounds just like that. Our culture sounds just like Crete. Our culture has a, uh, the mantra of our culture is what? If it feels good, do it. You be true to yourself. Our culture says this. Our culture says if you want to have sex outside of marriage, you do that. If, you're, if you want to marry someone of the same sex, do it. If you want to be another gender, do it. If you want to watch pornography, do that. If you want to masturbate, do it. If you want to get drunk, do that. If you want to be a glutton, do it. And if you want to buy things you cannot afford, do it. Is that not what our culture says? And that was what the island of Crete was like. And so Paul wants, these, wants Titus to teach these new Christians to say, you live different. He says that the grace of God trains us or is training us to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. And that's how we should live as Christians. Self-controlled, upright, and godly. In contrast to the world and these Cretan people, how they were living, we're to live differently. Because, why? Because the grace of God has come. We are not to be controlled by our flesh, but we are to be controlled by who? The Holy Spirit. If someone is truly walking by the Spirit, as Galatians 5 says, then we will live godly lives even in this present age. Look at how verse 12 ends. It says, in the present age. So basically what Paul is doing is he's drawing a distinction that right now we are in the present age. We are in the age where um, Jesus has come and he has brought salvation, but we still live under the effects of the fall, right? We've, for those of us that have come to know Christ, we're, we've been saved, but we still live in this world. We still war and battle against the flesh. We still are attacked by, uh, we're still in a state of spiritual warfare, right? We still struggle and war against sin, in this present age but we are to live godly lives in the present age why because Jesus when he returns that will be a new age it will be the age where we don't have those same battles anymore that Jesus when he comes and sets up his inaugurated or his fulfilled kingdom and whenever Satan is banished and thrown into the lake of fire then that's going to be a new age some people they think that when you make a decision for Jesus when you get baptized and then you just go to heaven when you die. But the reality is that who are the people that go to heaven? It is the people who live or the people that live forever in the kingdom of God are those that are serving King Jesus with their lives. Why would some, or, or when you go to heaven, when being with God in heaven is simply the culmination of a life that has been spent living for God and seeking his will even while we're here on earth. Remember the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6. Jesus said this. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Where? On earth as it is in heaven. See, that's the state of every true believer. They want God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Anything that we see that's not right on heaven we long, or in, on earth, we long for that to be righted. Because why? Because one day we know that Jesus is going to do that. Why would someone expect to bring glory to God in heaven forever when they have not spent their whole life seeking to bring glory to God here on earth? It's almost like people think there's some kind of switch that gets flipped, Right? Well, somebody comes down here, they make a profession of faith, they're baptized, they're on the church roll, they live, and some people think you just live your whole life the same way, and then, boom, there's a, a, a switch that gets flipped, now I go to heaven. But really what happens is when we turn from our sin and place our faith and trust in Jesus, that's when the switch gets flipped. You start living in light of that truth now, and then when, you, when Jesus does come back or when we pass away, whichever happens first, it's just an outgrowth and an outflow of what we've already, what's already happened in our own hearts. The true Christian longs for the appearing of Jesus. Look at verse 13. 
waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The grace of God has appeared, verse 11. The grace of God enables and empowers us to live godly lives, verse 12. As we wait for our blessed hope, the return and the appearing of Jesus Christ. As I thought about that this week, and it says that that's our blessed hope, the appearing of Jesus. And I thought about that, and I wanted to ask you, in your life, where have you put your hope? Where have you put your hope? If you have put your hope in worldly things, and your own fulfillment, and your own happiness, then you will live your life a certain way. You will love your sin, you will love worldly passions, and you will be driven by the flesh. But if you have put your hope in Jesus Christ, you will live a different way. You will love Jesus, you will love his people, you will love the church, and you will be led by the Spirit. If you, lo- if you live for yourself and the pleasures of this world, then that is where you have put your hope. But if you long for the appearing of Jesus, then you can be confident that you are a true believer in him. I thought about this. There are different attitudes that people have about Jesus' second coming. There are different. I mean, if you just talk to people and you said, if you talked with your family and friends and neighbors and you said, how do you feel about Jesus' second coming? I would say this, that unbelievers, they just disregard it. They openly disregard the second coming of Jesus. Perhaps they may have been to church or whatever, but they say, ah, that's, eh. Or even an atheist, they would say, there's no such thing. Jesus isn't coming back. The world's just, you know, it's just going to end eventually, but no. So unbelievers, they disregard the second coming of Jesus. They basically stick their head in the sand. But false converts, those that believe they are Christians but they are not, they secretly dread the second coming of Jesus. They dread the second coming of Jesus because they are not sure where they are with him. And so they dread his second coming. And then true believers, they fervently long for the second coming of Jesus. If you're truly in Christ, you long for his appearing. Why? Because you are tired of living in a sin-sick world. I'm tired of seeing cancer take people. I'm tired of seeing COVID take people. I'm tired of seeing babies being aborted. I'm tired of seeing a corrupt government take advantage of its citizens. I'm tired of all those things. I don't know about you. Probably the older you get, the more tired you become of all those things. But I, we, we don't just get tired of those, but we know that one day Jesus is going to come back. He's going to wipe away every tear. He's going to make all things new. And so we long for that. The grace of God has come in Jesus Christ, and one day he will come again. He will receive his bride and he will pour out his wrath on those that refuse to repent and turn to him. If Jesus was to come back today, would you be full of hope or would you be full of fear? If Je- Thank you. If Jesus was to come back today, would you be full of hope or full of fear? And I say this, your answer, you don't have to answer out loud, but your answer reveals your spiritual condition. If you are full of hope, then you can trust that you know Christ. But if you are full of fear, then you need to come down here and make it right with Christ today. God's grace has come in the person of Jesus. He has brought salvation. And as surely as he came the first time, he is coming again. Because of this reality, Paul says we should live spiritually sound lives. So the first thing we see is the reality of God's salvation. He has come and he will come. Now look at verse 14. We should also live sound lives because of the nature of God's salvation. Verse 14 says this, Who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Now again, this is a long sentence. It's a long run-on sentence, if you will. But he says, Who? Well, who is the who? Of course, it's Jesus from the end of verse 13. Jesus, who gave himself for us. We long for his appearing because he gave himself for us. That's what Jesus did on the cross. He willingly gave of himself for us. He laid down his life for us. 
No one took it from him. He willingly laid it down. Jesus could have called 10,000 angels to pull him off of that cross. or to, to He could have just blew at them and knocked everybody back. But he willingly laid his life down. His death on the cross was for us. Mark 10.45 says the Son of Man came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Verse 14, look at what it says. He gave himself for us to redeem us. Now, I don't know about you, but I think this is true. Everybody loves a good redemption story. Isn't that really what happens in nearly every movie? There's some kind of character that has some kind of flaw, and some way the story ends up making redeeming them or making, you know, that's kind of the, really the story of most stories. And that's what Jesus did. On our own, in our natural state, we were headed for hell. But Jesus gave himself so he could redeem us. He didn't leave us where we were. He came and died on the cross so he could redeem us from the law. If we were under the law, we would all perish and go to hell. But Jesus came to redeem us. But he came not to just keep us out of hell, but what? To redeem us from all lawlessness. Right? He didn't say just to redeem us so that we can get to heaven, but to redeem us from all lawlessness. What is, we don't use that word very much, lawless. What does that mean? To, what does lawlessness mean? A lawless person is someone who what? Has no regard for the law. Why don't, why don't gun-free zones work? Why? Because people that are going to break the law don't care if there's a sign up there or not. If you're going to go kill somebody, you don't, you don't go and say, oh, well, there's a sign. I guess I better can't, can't bring my gun in there. No, a person, because lawless people, they don't care what the law says. And in the same way, if someone is lawless in a spiritual sense, they don't care what God's word says. They don't care what his commands are. They don't care. And so a person that is living like that, that is a lawless person. They practice lawlessness. But Jesus, it says in verse 14, came to redeem us from all lawlessness. He came to redeem us from that life. And instead, the text says we should be a pure people. Look at the next phrase. It says, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and what? To purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Jesus did not just die to get us a free ticket to heaven. That's the way some people think. If you've ever played Monopoly, they think of that, I think it's community chess card. Get out of jail free. That's what they think salvation is. But it says here that Jesus didn't come to just give us a, a get out of jail free card. But it says that he came to purify for himself a people for his own possession. We are called to be people that are pure now. We belong to Jesus. We are his possession. Have you ever thought about that? That you belong to Jesus. If you are in him, you belong to him. Ephesians 5.27 says this. And this is a passage on uh, the church. It says that Jesus will present the true church, true, tr true Christians, to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she, that's the church, might be holy and without blemish. The church, which is the, I'm talking about the universal church, that's all Christians at all times and in all places, is the bride of Christ. And Jesus will have a pure bride. Jesus will not settle for a bride that is impure. The bride will be holy and without blemish. If you do not care about living for the glory of Jesus, then you are not part of of the bride of Christ. Does that know what it says right there on the screen in Ephesians 5.27? If you have no concern for living a pure life, then how can you expect to be part of the pure bride of Jesus Christ? We're to be pure people. In verse 14, we see this, that these same people are zealous for good works. True Christians are zealous for good works. I would hope that with my kids, the more that they grow to love me and Bethany, the more they will want to please us. The more they want to obey because they know that we, 
care for them. They know we want what's best for them. They, and they've learned to trust us. And in the same way, we should want to please our Lord Jesus. As we grow to know him even more and more, and he's changed our hearts, and we want to do what pleases him. We love him. We know that he's done what he's, he's died on the cross for our sins. He paid that penalty, and we should want to please him with our lives. Does that statement characterize you? Are you here this morning? Are you zealous for good works? Do you want to please God with your whole life? Is that you this morning? Or do you reluctantly come to church to make yourself feel better or to perhaps make someone else happy? We are to be zealous for good works. Now, I love this passage because verse 11 says what? Says what? The grace of God has come. Salvation is of God. We can't earn our salvation. But, verse 14, we are still to be zealous for good works. There is no false dichotomy. The grace of God has come, but we are to be zealous for good works. The relationship between faith and works is a simple one. Good works are the fruit of faith, not the root of faith. What do I mean by that? Good trees, they produce good fruit, right? If you go to a, and get, pick a, a yummy apple off of a wonderful apple tree, you say, hey, that's a good tree. Well, it's a good tree and it produces good fruit because it's a healthy tree. Its roots are strong. The, root is, the roots are getting the, nur- the nutrients that it needs. And so it produces good fruit. And likewise, we produce the fruit of good works, not to be saved, but because we have been saved. Jesus, the gospel, and new heart, that is the root of our faith. And good works are just the fruit of that healthy root. So we should live sound lives because of the reality and the nature of God's salvation. And finally, in verse 15, we see this, that pastors or elders should call Christians to live sound lives because of the authority of Jesus. It says, declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority, let no one disregard you. First, Paul says to Titus, declare these things. Well, what is these things? (laughs) I would say it's verses 2 through 14. Chapter 2, verse 1 says, teach what accords with sound doctrine. And then he spends the rest of the chapter doing just that. So he's to declare how Christians are to live. And then he says, exhort them. And then he says to what? Rebuke with all authority. Rebuke those that are teaching false things. Rebuke those that refuse to live godly lives. And then he says, let no one disregard you. Just in case there was some fuzziness from chapter 1 when Paul said to silence and rebuke false teachers, Paul again says to declare to exhort, to rebuke, and he says, let no one disregard you. And he says, do it with all authority. So chapter 2, this has been, there's not been a lot of imperatives, and boom, he comes with four imperatives in one verse. John MacArthur said, I can't remember the exact wording he used, but he said, this verse has more, says more about pastoral authority than any other verse. Because he tells Paul, he tells Titus, you do this, and don't let anyone disregard you so Titus where does he get this authority from he gets it from Paul where does Paul get that authority from from Jesus when we encourage and we we encourage other Christians and we rebuke people when they're in sin we and if we rebuke people from God's word then we go with the authority of Jesus you remember that Matthew 28 what did Jesus say at the end of the great commission or he says, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the ending or to the end of the age. But the first way that I'm sorry is the first part of the Great Commission. He says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That's what Jesus said. And he said, Go do this, right? Go make disciples. All authority has been given to Jesus. And Jesus, who called Paul to ministry? Jesus in Acts chapter 9 on Damascus Road. And so Paul is saying, you go with the authority of Jesus Christ. And likewise, 
if we, if we go to someone with the word of God and we show them clearly that what scripture says, rightly interpreted, right, that we got it right, we got what God's word says right, we go with them, we go with the authority of God himself. When you, any authority that I have as a preacher is derived from here, right? I don't have any authority on my own. But it's because I am pointing you to the word of God. Because this is God's word. This isn't something I made up. It's my job to simply say what this says. All right? And so any, uh, you should not do what I, or you should not give me any authority in and of myself. You shouldn't say, well, I'm just going to do this because the pastor said it. No, you do it because the word of God says it. Right? Don't listen to me because you like me or respect me. And on the flip side, don't not listen to me because you don't like me. We should only listen to a preacher or a pastor when they are teaching God's word accurately. In our church, and I'm talking about mostly our church role, some of our church role, we have people that need to be confronted in their sin. And that is a fact. I think everybody would agree with that. And Paul tells us to do that. He says to exhort, to rebuke, and let no one disregard you. And church family, we have some people that we need to lovingly speak the truth to. And I pray that you guys would help me and support me in that. Because God has called us to call people to godliness. Not because we are proud, not because they're not doing it just the way we're doing it. But because we are to be obedient to Jesus Christ himself. Because Paul has said, this is how we are to live. We're to renounce ungodliness, renounce worldly passions, and we're to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. And we're to call other people to do that. In th for three weeks in Titus 2, we've seen this, that, that the gospel changes us, period. If you haven't seen in the last three sermons that the gospel is supposed to change us, I don't know what else to do, Right? We are to, to not live a certain way, and we are to live a certain way. It's not enough to just know the Bible. It's not enough to know some sound doctrine. Instead, we must conform our lives to the truth of God's word, his holy and authoritative word. I saw something on Twitter this week that said, um, this guy that has a PhD, and he was saying that we've got, he's, <laughs> he basically said that if you have a PhD in religious studies, we got to quit calling any, or that basically none of those people could be false teachers, essentially. <laughs> he said, he said, anybody that has a PhD in, in religious studies, we should quit calling them wolves. Like wolves in sheep clothing, false teachers. As if just having some letters behind your name keeps you from teaching false things. The, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were the PhDs of their day. Right? Anyway, it just, it just made me laugh and cry at the same time to think that just because you have a good education that you can, anyway. You can know sound doctrine, you can have a PhD, but it does not matter if you don't conform your life to it. If we refuse to conform our lives to God's word, then we are lost and we need Jesus Christ. But the good news is that Jesus has come. He has died. He has brought salvation for all people that will turn to him and repent and to live a life of faith and godliness. So we should repent of our sins, turn to Christ, and then we should live godly lives as we wait. Jesus is coming again, so we need to live like he is. Let's go ahead and stand. We're going to have a song of response.